Good morning. Good Chicles, the country church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. Good morning. Good morning, country church. Beautiful day. We finally got into some sunshine today. I hope you enjoy the warmth because it's going to be almost 90. So you either get rain or you get 90 degrees. Let's stand, and if you would, uh, we're going to read the uh, scripture at this time. It's Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's all bow in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We know that you are going and are in this place of worship, through the music, through the written word, through the scriptures, through the preaching. In every part of this service, you are present. So as you are present in this service, let you be present in our lives. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Greet one another in the name of the Lord. Well, I'm still uh, ruthless. She's been gone for two weeks, and she informed me uh, yesterday she'll be home the 4th of May. So um, I thought grandchildren were important, but apparently great-grandchildren are even more important. And uh, at least I know where I rank in this area of importance. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day. Um, if you haven't found Philippians 2, 5 through 11, I hope you're looking there right quick. But I was talking to somebody the other day. You know, when I had children, uh, fathers were absolutely useless, worthless, during the, during the birthing process. You know, we, we had the responsibility to get the mothers to the hospital and then to stay out of the way until they called us from the stork room. How many remember the stork room? <laughs> and to see what the Lord had given us. We didn't have any idea in those days whether it was going to be a boy or a girl. Or, well, it has to be a boy or a girl. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to figure out what... Uh, what, what Ruth is accomplishing over there, besides taking pictures. She's taking a lot of pictures. Anyway, be in prayer for me, not only today as I preach, but uh, it's been a long time since I've, uh, I've batched. And, uh, you know, I, it's probably good for me because I really appreciate how much she does. And, and I don't think this is going to happen again. Of course, I've made those kinds of statements before. <laughs> Let me ask you once again to stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. I want to read it one more time. Paul writing to the church at uh, Philippi. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped and held on to. But he made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, 
God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. <clears throat> and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father, I'm thankful that we have the privilege to come into your presence because we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been saved, redeemed, ransomed because He was obedient to death on a cross. And for that, we are grateful and humbled and thank you. Now, Lord, I pray you take your word, speak to me and to each one of us to do in our lives, to accomplish in our hearts exactly what you desire. We already are saying, yes, Lord, yes. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. I think in, in recent years, the most popular method for telling someone how to be saved is by use of the Roman road. And one of the primary reasons for that is you don't have to do a lot of biblical gymnastics. You go to the, to the book of Romans. You start in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. And the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, we're all what? We're all sinners. We're all in need of God's forgiveness in our lives. And then we go to Romans 6, 23. And there in Romans 26... Uh, in Romans 6, 23, we find out the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So we start with the problem, but immediately we address what is a potential solution to the problem. Then we move to Romans 5, 8. And there the Bible says, God demonstrates or shows His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so we now catch a glimpse of just how valuable and loving God is toward us. And then we can throw in John 3.16 here if we want to. That takes us out of the Romans, but most of us know that verse. But then we come down to the concluding uh, portion of the Roman road, where we come to our destination. Romans chapter 10, verses 9, 10, and 13. Where the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And then everybody know, knows Romans 10, 13, 13. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Say that with me. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So here in a nutshell is how we make the pilgrimage from being a person that has no hope to a person who is delivered in Christ Jesus, called the Roman road. So, in this, there is this uh, confession that the resurrected Jesus is Lord, is Lord. So, what does it mean to confess that Jesus is Lord? Well, that's, Lord is not a term that we use too much today in America, except in this religious sense. So increasingly, people do not know what the Bible means when it says that we must confess Jesus as Lord. I mean, is it just making a statement? Is that what it is? Well, I want to, today to explore this idea of Lordship. So hopefully we can gain a better understanding. If you don't know Jesus as Lord, that you will know that. And if you do, that you will be affirmed in that relationship with Him. Another way to express this idea of the Lordship of Christ is to ask questions like, Who is your boss? Or, Who's in control of your life? Now, these are the kinds of questions I often and usually ask children in an effort to help them to understand, after they've read through these verses, what it means when you talk about the Lordship of Christ. By the way, just to kind of give you an answer, anytime that you answer that question, who's your boss, the answer is, it's whoever you allow to be your boss. Um, 
It's always a matter of your decision. Somebody can be called boss. Somebody can be called Lord. Somebody can be called in charge. But the truth is, nobody's in charge of you unless you submit to that charge. Uh, certainly not very honorably anyway. So you and I have the privilege and the opportunity and the responsibility to decide who it is that's in control of our lives, who it is that exercises authority in our lives. Now, the truth is, we've all seen that in the lives of our children. When I started having children, uh, I thought they would be born with a blank slate, and I would be able to fill in the blackboard. What I ultimately discovered was there wasn't even a place for marginal notes. They were born with their own personality, their own way of doing things, and so I was, I was quickly challenged about how to be a parent. Because I thought it was like the military. I give an order, and they would respond with a cheery, aye, aye. But it just didn't, it didn't work out like that. So if you're, uh, if you're newly parents, and you've got that precious little bundle, like my great-grandchildren, you're in for a real ride. And uh, if nothing else, God will teach you how to pray in the process. So when the Bible uses this term, Lord, it is describing someone who legitimately owns, that means right, and powerfully controls, that means might. Legitimately owns, that means they have the right, and powerfully controls, mean they have the might. Now we might see this concept, or we do in fact all the time, in geopolitical relationships. For example... Who is, it, who is it that heads up ISIL today? We hear all about that. You know who it is? It's a guy by the name of al-Baghdadi. And in that case, he is the tyrant that runs this terrorist organization. Now, is he Lord? No. And I'll tell you why. His legitimacy is lacking. Oh, he's got power. I mean, he did, he, they kill people right and left. But... The right of lordship is illegitimate. So he's not a lord. Now we could take the other side of that as well. Do you know who the premier of Iraq is? Well, it's not al-Baghdadi, it's al-Abadi. I don't think they're any kin, but anyway. Now, in that case, he is democratically elected. So he has the right of lordship, but he's a paper tiger. He has to have Iran do his fighting for him. And so in these two cases, we see how often we can confuse this idea of lordship. For someone to be a legitimate lord, they must have both the right and the might to exercise authority. Say that with me. The right and the might to exercise authority. That's what it is to be a legitimate lord. So let me demonstrate the relevancy to you and me here at the very, the very beginning of this message. Someone or something is acting as your Lord, and that someone is your Lord by your choice. It's not accidental. For many of us, we can identify who's Lord of our lives by simply looking in a mirror. That's who we really want to be in charge of our lives. We set ourselves up to act as our Lord. And we, uh, we demonstrate that when we express attitudes like, uh, nobody tells me what to do. I do what I like whenever I feel like it. Have you ever thought things like that or said things like that? Well, I promise you, it is a rebellious attitude, but uh, it's just not true. I mean, it is a delusion on our part, but anytime we express that, what we're really saying is, I answer to me and to no one else. Now, what do you think is the primary attitude in our country today? We're narcissistic. That's a fancy word, meaning it's all about, it's all about me. We, in America, basically bow at the altar of the unholy trinity. Me, myself, and I. And as a result, we, are, we, have, we have a difficult time submitting ourselves to the Lord. 
Now, we were created with what the Bible calls a free will. And so, therefore, you and I have the privilege to yield control of our lives to someone that's greater than we are. And I submit to you today that the only one who has the legitimate right and powerful might to be your Lord is Jesus. And I can assure you this, that if you have not and are not submitting the control of your life to the Lord Jesus, you're settling for a Lord who is inadequate. You're settling for a Lord who lacks the right and the might and who will ultimately fail you. You can't be your own Lord. Because what you'll ultimately discover, and this doesn't happen until you're over 30, but what you ultimately discover is you don't control anything. You don't even control your wife. Even if you were married in the old days when she had a different vow than you did. Anybody remember that? She used to have this in her vow, submit. Yeah, I, I'm really stirring up some stink here right now, I can tell you. It didn't make any difference. It was just a ploy. I should have been the one that said that. So the Lord who deserves your obedience should be the one who possesses the right and the might to exercise absolute authority. And such absolute might and absolute right are attributes only of deity. Only Almighty God can properly be called Lord. The Hebrews call the living God Adonai, which is Hebrew for Lord. The Greeks call the living God Kurios, which is Greek for Lord. But we have the opportunity to call Him an English word, which is Master and Lord. So my purpose today is to inform you that you can trust your life to the control of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will ask you, to decide to follow Jesus. I will ask you to make Him your reason for living. Now let me take the pressure off. My job is not to convince you of anything. I am a messenger. So what you do with the truth is between you and God. I'll walk out of here rejoicing no matter what you do. Because He and I have got it together. We've got it right. But I'm an information person. I'm a messenger. But you have the responsibility, and you will be hold account held accountable for what you do with the truth. But I can assure you that you will find any other Lord to be inadequate to face life and insufficient to face death in your life. So our text declares in verse 10, At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those where? in heaven, on earth, and under the, under the earth. So what we're going to do is we're going to investigate by what right and by what might Jesus is Lord in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Well, Jesus is Lord in heaven, the Scripture says, if indeed every knee shall bow in heaven. So by what right and by what might is Jesus Lord in heaven? Well, by the right of inheritance, Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. And according to John chapter 1, He is equal with God the Father. Also in Philippians, where we read, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped and held on to, but He emptied Himself. So, by His rightful heirship, He is Lord of heaven. All th Jesus said, all things that the Father has are mine. So by the right of inheritance, which we recognize here, don't we? I mean, if you're the only, the only son of a, of a family, then you would be the rightful heir of that family. But it's one thing to be the rightful heir. It's another thing to be able to gain what is required. So it's by the right of inheritance, but it's by the might of righteousness. The might of righteousness. Let me, let me see if I can uh, help you see this a little bit. Have you ever considered the persuasive power of purity? 
I mean, somebody who's got it together, particularly in their relationship with the Lord, and you see no hypocrisy in their lives, they develop a tremendous respect. I can give you an example. Do you remember Mother Teresa? Do you remember her? When she was uh, alive, and, and Bill Clinton, another old Arkansas boy, <laughs> was president of the United States, he invited Mother Teresa to the prayer breakfast that the president gives. And she came. At that time, people who, who had the audacity to speak about the immorality of abortion were shunned and put down and considered to be whatever. But Mother Teresa spoke at that prayer breakfast. And you know what she talked about? She talked about the ungodliness and the criminality of abortion. Nobody said a word. Now, why not? Because she had the persuasive power of purity in her life. Billy Graham is another one who has that same thing. Here's a man whose character and ministry has been beyond reproach. He has been respected by multiple presidents who themselves were ungodly. But they respected him because of the pers persuasive power of purity. Now, what has that got to do with what we're talking about here? Well, let me, let me try to, to show you. When God in the Garden of Eden created Adam and Eve, this was his highest creation. And so the angels of heaven, the hosts of heaven, were surely observing what, the, what God was doing. And here is his highest creation, even higher than the angels in the hierarchy of heaven. And what happened almost immediately? They rebelled. They sinned. They failed. They weren't righteous. And now you go all through the history, from Adam and Eve all through the history. We can name Abraham, the father of faith. Was he a righteous man? Only by faith in his life. He even lied about his wife being his sister. He compromised on what God wanted him to do in order to have a son. Abraham was not righteous. Isaac, Jacob, who by his very name was deceiver. Come to Moses. I mean, you go down through the history. David, Solomon, all the prophets, every one of them did what? They sinned. They failed. And finally, born of a virgin was Jesus. Jesus has the persuasive power of purity because he was tempted in every way like you and I yet without sin he lived it out and because of that you and I have the opportunity to be forgiven because the righteous one died on a cross for our sins he didn't die for his own he died he died for ours so the hosts of heaven fall down before the righteous Son of God who was tempted in all ways, but He did better than any other human has ever lived or ever will live. And because of that, they cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive honor and glory and power. You created all things, and by your will they existed. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. Holy, holy, holy. That's what's going on in heaven. Not only is He the Son of God and have the right of inheritance to be Lord in heaven, but He has demonstrated that He is worthy by righteousness to be Lord in heaven. The angels announced His birth. They ministered to Him in the wilderness and in the garden. They stood ready at Calvary. They roll away the stone at the tomb and they worship Him today as Lord. Jesus is Lord in heaven. And every knee bows in heaven and confesses Jesus is Lord. Well, how about earth? According to our scripture, Jesus is Lord on earth if indeed every knee shall bow on earth. Well, you have the same two questions. By what right and what might? Well, the right is the right of design. I mean, consider His plan. Jesus foreknew the world and all it contains. He holds a registered 
trademark, patent, an unexpiring copyright on His creation. And we are created in His image. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but um, on uh, Sunday when we put the words to the, to the songs up there, uh, some of you probably picked this up, you know when you're singing the last chorus or phrase, because why? Credits? <laughs> yeah, credits. Down in the corner, on one of the corners there, there will be all these little writings. You know why we put that up there? Because we're legally required to put it up there. That says who wrote it, who holds the copyright on that thing, because somebody legitimately owns that. In order for, the, for us to use that, we have, a, we have a program, we keep track of that, we report it, and uh, we pay for that. We pay, unless it's a public domain uh, uh, something, if it's still copyrighted, we pay for that to use it because somebody owns it. They have the right of ownership. This earth was designed and created by the Lord Jesus Christ, and He holds a copyright on it. And any time we abuse His copyright, and we abuse His image in us, we are basically violating some kind of divine law. Well, it's called, we know what the law is, don't we? It's the Ten Commandments for a, bait for a start. But consider His purpose. From the very beginning, Jesus predestined us to be conformed with His image as adopted sons. And now He works in our lives as we trust Him to conform us into His image. He's got a plan. And any time we violate that plan, we are basically violating the one who created us and put a stamp of His image in our hearts. So He owns us by the right of design. But by what might? That's what I call the might of creation power. Everything that exists, He spoke into existence. Now, have you ever tried to speak something into existence? It's pretty hard, isn't it? In fact, it's near about impossible unless you are the Son of God. With Him, ain't no big thing. In other words, He's spoken into being. He's got this an awesome power, and He works His plan. Now, the Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, that He controls all things. God is in control. No matter whether you understand it or not, no matter whether you think it's pleasant or not, He controls all things, and we know that He causes all things to work together for good to those who love Him or are called according to His purpose. It may not feel good, it may not look good, but you can rest assured that God's got a plan you haven't even thought about. And He's working that plan in your life. But let me show you how He does control all things. When I, uh, when I was... Uh, in the Navy, I was a nuclear engineer. And one of my responsibilities was to serve as the training officer at the S5G prototype in Idaho, well, near Idaho Falls, Idaho. And so uh, it just sort of dawned on me one day, because you know the basic model we use in describing how all matter is created, or not created, consists, of all matter consists of. It consists of a, the smallest indivisible particle is called an... An atom, an atom, exactly. Now what happens when we fission atoms for nuclear power is we basically split the nucleus and that releases energy and a couple of neutrons and those neutrons hit other atoms and boom, boom. I mean, you can have, well, if you control it, it doesn't go boom, but if you don't, uh, it can be pretty, pretty awesome. Okay. Now, let me just review a little basic science with you. An atom is composed of three particles. They are protons, neutrons, electrons. Wait, man, what a, this group is good. That's right. Now, the nucleus has two of those particles, the nucleus of the atom. And the nucleus has what particles? Protons and neutrons. Protons have what charge? P pro, positive, yeah, positive. Neutrons have what charge? No, they have no charge. <laughs> Electrons have the negative. I, I'm just glad I, otherwise I'd have to sanction you all nukes or something. <laughs> okay, so in the nucleus, you have the protons and neutrons. 
Neutrons, no charge. Protons, a positive charge. And they are clustered up tightly, held together by something we call nuclear binding energy. That's the energy we release when we fission that nucleus of the atom. Well, so what? Well, here's the so what. Have you ever played with magnets? If you take two magnets and you put them together, what happens? Well, it depends, doesn't it? If you bring the north pole of one atom and the north pole of the, I mean, one magnet and the north pole of the other, they, won't, they, they don't want to go together. They repel. If you flip one of them over, sucks up there, likes that. Okay. Now, what did we say was in the nucleus? Positive charges and no charge. And all these protons, which should repel each other, should fly apart, should not like one another, they snuggle up real tight together. Question is, why? Answer is, we don't know. It is a mystery. I mean, here we are messing around with atoms, and we don't even know what causes them to hold together scientifically. We know how much energy you release when you fission it. We know what you get when you fission it. We can measure that energy, but we don't have the answer. It's one of those mysteries. In the same way, gravity is a mystery. We don't know what causes gravity. We know that the diameter of the two bodies will determine the amount of attraction, which I've always thought looks to me like big fat people would really be attracted to one another. But I'm sorry, I don't know where that came from. That's just, that's just, don't tell the pastor, Phil. <clears throat> now, only the Bible tells us the answer. Only the Bible. I told you about Colossians 1.16 where it says that he created all things. And, but Colossians 1.17 says he holds all things together. In other words, our existence, our world, is a remarkable mystery that only is answered by the presence of the living God. If Jesus took his hands off of his universe, there would be a big bang. Because every nucleus of every atom would fly apart. He has the power to control, not only to make it, but control it. And because he has the awesome right of design and the incredible power of creation power, he deserves to be Lord on earth. And one day, every knee shall bow in acknowledgement of that authority. Well, we got one other area. We take all possible areas of existence. Heaven, earth, and under the earth. What's under the earth? Magna. No, that's not what it's talking about. Crust. Hell's under the earth. The place of the dead. That's what it's really talking about. That other realm of existence. So by what right does Jesus exercise authority in hell? By the right of redemption. See, that's what happened at Calvary's cross. We're released from the condemnation of sin. Because the wages of sin is... And we have redemption only through His blood. He paid my price. He received my sentence. He died in my stead. He is my substitute. And because of that, He has the right to be Lord under the earth. Now, by what might... Well, by the might of resurrection power. Resurrection power. We find that when Jesus walked this earth, He raised the dead. In Luke chapter 7, He raised the son of the widow at Nain. In Luke chapter 8, He raised the daughter of Jairus. And in John chapter 11, He raised Lazarus. All from the dead. So He demonstrated that He has that kind of power. He has the power over life and death. Then Jesus Himself was raised from the dead. The Bible says in Romans 1, 4, that he was declared with power to be God's son by his resurrection. But here's the great news. Jesus 
will raise the dead in Christ. In fact, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the dead in Christ will be raised first. And then those who yet remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. It's called the rapture. So Jesus is Lord under the earth by the right of redemption and by the might of resurrection power. In other words, Jesus is Lord. He's the only legitimate sovereign with omnipotent power to exercise absolute authority. But the question comes down to this. Who is your Lord? And I don't mean just a profession of the mouth. I mean, who is it that exercises authority in your life? Who is it that makes your decisions? Is it, is it still you that's pulling the strings? Or are you in submission to Him? Now today, you and I, in this life, still have the ability to contest His right and to challenge His might. And you might wonder why. Why does the Lord, why does the Lord give us that authority? I, you know, it's a good thing I'm not the Lord. I wouldn't put up with some of you. <laughs> squashed like a bug. But you know what? I'd have been squashed a long time ago if that was the Lord's attitude. I'll tell you why. He gives that, us that privilege to say anything we want to. To declare ourselves independent agents, atheists, agnostics, or whatever. I'll tell you why. Because he wants to convince you, not by coercion, but by love, that he's worth being your Lord. He allows himself to be abused, just like he did when he walked this earth. Not because he's powerless to do anything about it. Because the Bible says when he was hanging on that cross, he could have called 10,000 angels, one of which could, could wipe out an army of 185,000, according to what happened in the Old Testament. So it wasn't, it wasn't a matter of him not having the ability. It was a matter of him laying down his life so that we could see that he loves us. His authority is based upon love, not upon coercion. The Bible says he's patient towards you, not wishing that any two should perish, but that all of us should come to repentance. So no matter who controls your life right now, the reality is still Jesus is Lord. That's true whether you choose to submit to His authority or not. But you can be certain of one thing, absolutely certain of one thing. One day you shall indeed bow your knee and confess with your tongue that Jesus is Lord. Whether in heaven, on earth, Or in hell. There'll be no question on your mind. There'll be no question about who is Lord. If you confess Him today, then when He comes in glory, He will receive you not as a rebellious servant or creature, but as an adopted son. Jesus said this, Whoever shall confess me before men, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. So, have you confessed Jesus as Lord? Not just said the words, but have you bowed the knees of your heart? That's the way our pastor expresses it. Have you bowed the knees of your heart and acknowledged that he is your Lord? Ask him to save you. Come into your heart. Have you made your stand for him publicly? In fact, the Bible says that if, you don't, if you're ashamed of him, that he'll be ashamed of you. Does your family know that Jesus is your Lord? Does your neighbors know that Jesus is your Lord? Do those you work with, do they know that Jesus is your Lord? Do those who hear your casual conversations know that Jesus is Lord? Do your actions declare, I'm a servant, a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ? So who's your boss? Who's in control of your life? Who is your Lord? Why not make that confession today? You'll make it someday. Why not make it today? And as a result, be gloriously and miraculously saved. It's a great opportunity. 
It's my privilege to be a messenger and give you this kind of information, this kind of news, so that you might live victoriously, triumphantly, because the Lord defeated death, hell, and the grave. And He'll be that kind of victor in your life. For greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world. Would you bow with me? Our Father and our God, I want to thank you that Jesus is Lord. And Father, I thank you that you, that you broke into my life, that you sought me while I was yet a sinner, and Father, you said that you've come to seek and to save those who are lost. And I pray that today, Father, those who are here, who've never made that kind of profession, never trusted you, never proclaimed you to be Lord, right now, they'll get that settled. Bow the knees of their heart and confess Jesus is Lord and be powerfully and miraculously saved. And for those of us, Lord, that we've made that decision, but we kind of, uh, we, we go back and forth and, and we slither off the altar rather than staying there and let you be in charge, I pray today we'll make a new commitment of our lives. And for those who have been saved, never been baptized, never been faithful in obeying you to be baptized, I pray today, Lord, they'll get right. They'll get their, their baptism on the right side of their salvation. And for those who are here that don't have a church home, Father, I pray during this invitation, they'll respond, come, and confess you. And Lord, say, I want to be a part of a fellowship, a family that believes your word. That's my prayer, Father. I pray that your spirit will have his will and his way in Jesus' name.